Everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, we've got the state of the art lights going. Uh, we do a little work. I'd like to welcome everyone here this beautiful morning. And uh, my, my name is Alan Weinberg. I'm a trustee of the Hadley Public Library as well as the Hadley Historical Society. Uh, Patrick Farazo is our library director. Uh, the two organizations are co-sponsoring this talk, and we um, we're, it's great to see everyone come out. With so many people, this is I think our biggest crowd in our new community, in our new life. So welcome, and uh, we have a, a very interesting talk for you today. I'd like to introduce, well, before I introduce our speaker, those of you who have me will already know about the two radio sides, uh, Goff and Whaley, who were sheltered in town for many years. Uh, but the third, it was a third radio side who came to uh, New England, um, and his name was John Fitzwell, and we a lot about him. Before I start our notes, for those people who are listening on Zoom, please mute your microphones so we don't get any feedback. Hear that? If you're listening on Zoom, please mute your microphones. The, another couple of things is there are some refreshments in the lobby or after the talk. Help yourself to those. I'm going to stop the work. That'll work. Good. That's much better. Thank you. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sarah Dixwell Brown, <laughs> who has written a book, which is, by the way, for sale in the lobby as well, on her ancestor, John Dixwell. And uh, we'd like to welcome Sarah Dixwell Brown. Mm -hmm. Well, gosh, <laughs> there's a lot of you. I was kind of hoping that happened. So I, I do want to thank Alan, and I want to thank Patrick. Um, and I'm so pleased to say all three of my siblings are here, and at least one second cousin, maybe two. Two second cousins. <laughs> three second cousins. <laughs> go, go right No, no, no. no. <laughs> Yeah. Use the microphone. Um, I want to say some of those second cousins have big swells in the middle, so I'm not the only one. Am I? Can you hear me through? Yeah. Yeah. As a right, I wrote this down because I knew I'd be a nervous wreck. So here I go. I'll be extemporaneous if I calm down, but I'm not counting on that. As a writing teacher, I often ask students to think about who their audience is. So I thought I'd better follow my own advice. How many people in this room or on Zoom are descendants of John Dixwell? How many people are residents of Hadley? I'm aware you may know much more about the Hadley Regicides than I do, and I will get to them before too long, and you can correct me in the Q&A. First, though, I want to go back to 1980 and the day I first encountered John Nixwell in an old Brook in a British museum. I was a graduate student in a program in a university in California, and their name for us, if we weren't getting PhDs, we were called the Terminal Master's Candidates, <laughs> which does sound like a form of cancer. <laughs> and they did to see us as our cash. So I was supposed to write a paper, but my professor said, you don't have to, because of course they didn't really want to read the papers of the terminal master candidates. So there I was in London, and I thought, I would write the paper anyway, because I was so conscientious. And I thought, no, no, I can write that paper. What will I do instead? So I started looking up last names and last names. There's a lot of real weird last names in my family, like Wigglesworth. But anybody with Wigglesworth as a middle name, please raise your hand. Yeah. And then I thought, well, I'll look up Dixwell. And um, in a couple of books in the British Museum, are you having trouble hearing me? In a couple of books in the British Museum, reading them were two books with the name John Bixwell in it. So, um, in a couple of books, I 
most of the, their names are being spelled Whaley and Gama, I encountered an unfamiliar word. Now, I, as I am a teacher, I'd like another show of hands of anyone who never heard the word regicide before. Yeah, you don't have to admit it, but I'm glad a lot of you did. Regicide was meant to be, but it sure looked as if it has something to do with um, killing, as in <laughs> pesticide, insecticide, <laughs> germicide, homicide. <laughs> By the way, it's such an obscure word, we couldn't decide whether it should be in the title of the book. But regicide is so completely at the center of everything, we just had to put the book itself, I mean, the word itself on the cover, and the title we ultimately chose was thought of by my friend, the scholar Edie Clues. Thank you, Edie. I hope she's on Zoom from Virginia. I learned in high school Latin that reg means to direct, to lead, to rule. Think regiment, regime, regulate, regal, think king. Then move on to side, to kill, Owen, oh, king killer, the killing of a king. In this case, Charles I in 1649. But then this morning I went down in the basement and I looked up my old Latin dictionary and I looked up Rex Regus, which means king, but his other definitions are king, tyrant, despot, patron, or rich man. I thought, whoa. <laughs> so what on earth happened in England to lead a king to be to lead to a king being beheaded in a public ceremony on a scaffold erected in front of one of his own London palaces? He stepped out of the window and prayed before quietly kneeling down and placing his royal head on the block. What a horrifying story! And it's too complicated a story for this book launch, so read the book. <laughs> but I thought it might be a little tiny bit, okay? So this is from the moment of impact, of the, the horror of finding this word, um, when I looked at the book in the British Museum. Someone sharing my unusual name was one of 59 judges who signed the death warrant. The death warrant is up there, a copy of it. For Charles the First, it was the first and only time in England that ordinary persons, instead of resorting to assassination, had the conviction and boldness to bring their king to trial, find him guilty of treason, and execute him in as nearly a legal fashion as they could muster. It alarmed royal families throughout Europe. <laughs> Many of Charles's subjects, horrified by the execution, concluded he was a Christian martyr, a title he holds to this day. The Society of Charles, King Charles the Martyr, was formed in 1894. Its American region currently has more than 400 members. Just then. And then, because Queen Elizabeth just had her um, Latin Jubilee. I thought I had to read this paragraph. <laughs> so there it was in the library, don't read it out, right? Because I read that his, the piece, his, he fled to New England and his son went to Boston where I was born. I thought, oh, I'm not related. So if John Dixon wound up in New England, I might be descended from him. The possibility, both electric wide and of Can you all hear me now? Parth. <laughs> what? Worth talking. What? Awesome. What? Awesome. Yeah. How's that? <laughs> Have you not heard word thus far? <laughs> I mean, this would be good. Okay. So now are you happy? If John Gitswell wound up in New England, I might be descended from him. The possibility both electrified and upset me in the hushed, deeply British decorum of the reading room. My heart began to race. I'd always known I was descended on both sides, 
from English ancestors, but not from someone who'd done something like this. If I were related to the regicide sharing my name, would I even now be an enemy of England? <laughs> Queen Elizabeth would not have me to tea, <laughs> though I had secretly and atavistically hoped she would, my being so very English at my roots. Perhaps I should turn up my collar, sink down in my chair, and make sure none of the mesmerized readers under the timeless blue dome of the reading room realized that Duke's well on the wrong side might be an event. <laughs> <laughs> It's been 42 years I've been working on this book, and I just <laughs> never felt me was it would still be here to remember. <laughs> I'm not really that. I mean, I believe she has a good sense of humor. I believe she hosted Paddington Bear for tea. And um, you said something. My song brought British biscuits. So, it's McFitties. So but there was something else that horrified me that May morning of 1980 in London, aside from the word regicide, and that was that, oh, I shouldn't read that because I got this word. When I got home from England and asked my father if we were related, the name Dick Stoll came from his side of the family. His reaction did nothing to calm me down. <laughs> and I will not describe it. But first I will say Dick Stoll signature is number 38. But Whaley's was number four, so he's much more cool. <laughs> and Goff is like 18, so he's in between guilty and totally guilty. All right. So I said to him, I said, Dad, I found this book with the name, this guy named Dick Who, And he went, are we related? I said, he goes, <laughs> and then he said, yeah. And then there was this awful pause, and then he said, directly. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to pass, fast forward another 10 years to the day he gave me the key, and I brought the key so you can see it. And it's in a beautiful um, Tesla case made in Korea because the person who made this book possible is here, Lee Jung King. There she is. <laughs> This pencil case is actually from Nam Choi, but still, me trying to sell came with me to London. I'm so glad you're here. You should come sit here. <laughs> She's been my student since before I was born. <laughs> She's moving to California, and I'm so heartbroken. <laughs> okay, so now I could really be good. Huh. Let's see. This is about the day that we need to keep Are you with you here. Let's see. Dad did not seem excited the day he gave me John Nixwell's key. There was nothing ceremonial about the moment I became the ninth generation to receive it. Dad appeared in the kitchen where I was helping mom peel potatoes. And he has something in one fist. You might as well have this. Your name is Dick's well. He said, his tone apologetic as if he was about to burden me. He had to me something surprisingly dense, bundled up in a plastic produce bag from the local supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> It was recycled, of course. <laughs> My parents, who lived through the Great Depression, reused aluminum foil and string. I put down my potato peeler and took it. Who knows if I even washed my hands? You should have it, he went on wearily. You're the one who's found out the most about John Dixon. <laughs> and it's your name. I could see he felt guilty that he didn't know more himself as if his 12-hour-day schedule as an editor in an orthopedist should have left him time to do genealogy. What is it, I asked. He didn't answer, 
just waited as I opened the bag, on which was printed in orange and brown, the fruit center marketplace, <laughs> a shopping adventure. <laughs> then pulled out the big rough minor key. Good heavens, said my mother. It isn't every day that your father gives you a 17th century key to a castle in England. Several moments went by before I remembered to read. Here's an odd thing, though. You might think that as being a key to a castle would have aroused my curiosity. I might have wondered why John Nixville had a key to a particular castle and what he did there, but it didn't occur to me to wonder. Nor did Dad say anything about it. Instead, my eyes were fixed on the word on its yellow label, the word I learned for the first time in the reading room of the British Museum, regicide. I said aloud, king killer. I added as if we needed the definition in order to grasp the severity of what our forebear had done. Dad shook his head moodily, and I felt a mix of awe and horror. Something about holding the key in my hand and reading Epson's notes, that's my great great grandfather, brought the execution of Charles the First, Charles the First, right into the room with us. John Dixwell well, really had done that. I really was his descendant. For here was his key passed down through 300 years to me, his namesake. That's right, Mom said. You should have it. She took it from me, studied the label, then handed it back to me as carefully as if it were fine china. I rolled it back up in the produce bag. If Mom thought that's rapid job was a bit casual for something with this much historical significance, she didn't say so, and neither did I. I put it in my pocketbook. As I drove to my home in Western Massachusetts later that day, I couldn't stop thinking about axes. My father was skillful with an axe. Splitting on the wood we burned for heat in the winter. This chopping block was a big stump he placed in the circle in front of our big house. The circle also had a massive ash tree from which he hung an odd red metal disc of a swing for me, the littlest child. It wasn't a good swing for pumping yourself higher and higher. You needed two ropes for that, and this had only one right in the center. But it was good for quietly dangling near my father. He never had time to play with me, but I loved being close to him, adoring him as he worked himself into a sweat. I swung lazily in desultory circles, watching his axe swoop down on each chunk of wood, splitting it so forcefully the halves flew apart. Dad was tall and had broad shoulders, up went the axe over his head, then down with deadly accuracy. He never missed his mark. <laughs> he disliked another use of his axe, the beheading of our chickens when they got too old to lay eggs. And so did we. My next up sister, Nina, and I would peer miserably for the upstairs masters as Dad came in the front door holding a chicken or two by the legs blood dripping from the stumps where their heads used to be. Her mother waited in the kitchen with a vat of boiling water into which she plunged each chicken until its feathers were loose enough to pluck. No wonder the removal of the king's head was so vivid for me. <laughs> <laughs> I knew exactly how that executioner raised his axe and the noise it made as it tore through Charles's neck. Whack. Had John Dixwell attended the execution? Was he close enough to hear that sound? Was it such an appalling moment that he wondered if he'd done the right thing by signing that warrant? When I got home, I hid the key in my desk drawer, irrationally afraid someone might recognize its historical value and try to steal it. So please don't. <laughs> but even from its drawer, muffled in its plastic stag, it was worthy. We should learn how it came to pass that Charles I wound up with the dubious distinction of being the only ruling British monarch ever to be formally executed by his own. It took another 20 years for me to work up the courage to go to England and take the key back to Dover Castle. I probably wouldn't have found the courage if my wonderful student, Lee Jung Kim, had not volunteered to talk. You want to take up your mask for
And the ones that only have all those Latin dictionaries to look up Rego, Regaria, and Rex Reg because she made me teach her three sons Latin. <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> I spent two weeks in England going everywhere I could, which had evidence of the Dixwell family in the 16th and 17th centuries. My next reading describes the day I met archivists at the castle. I'd spent the night before at Broom Park, the mansion built in the 1630s by John Dixwell's Uncle Bassing. So, let's see. How many this go there? That's called Broom Park. It costs like millions of dollars to build. We wonder where all those millions of dollars came from. Towns, maybe from the fur trade, maybe from making rope. We're not sure. So um, after having a more or less sleepless night in a castle, I, I mean, it, it is a castle in a manor house. I went to um, Dover Castle, and my next and final reading is that. Because I, I was going to read a whole lot about when we the home, and I thought this audience knows so much more about them than I do that that's just too scary. So I'm just going to show you pictures, we leave the home pictures. Okay, let's see. I think I did something accidentally. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything. You can mute that person. Well, well, so I had trouble when I was setting up the trip because Americans answer emails right away or they did before texting. But in England, they don't answer for weeks. And I just didn't know if I was even going to get an interview at Dover Castle. And I was just on tender hooks about that. But I finally heard back from this woman named Rowena Willard Wright. And I'd seen at the bottom of her email, which one of you is willing to deal with Dixie? I mean, the rudest thing. <laughs> Dear, this is her email. Dear Dixie, would Wednesday morning around 11 a.m. be convenient for you to meet at Dover Castle Stone Hut? Kind regards, Rowena. Willard Bright, Senior Curator, Stone Hut, Dover Castle, Dover. Stone Hut sounded like a Roman woman. The conquer, conquering Romans had come from Dover in 43 AD. But Dover Castle's website said the Stone Hut was built in 12, 1912 to the Royal Garrison of Chilery. My taxi driver had never heard of it. We entered the castle and drove past gray walls punctuated with crumbling towers until he dropped me off at a place he did know, a lunchroom featuring a massive cannon from some king's work. The cashier dragged me across the road, but there were so many buildings it took me a while to figure out which was the one I wanted. I kept checking the time. It was already 11, and the stone hut was locked. Tentatively, I knocked on the big door. No answer. Several minutes went by while my adrenaline spiked. I was now late and I couldn't get into this forbidding pile of rock. I resorted to hammering and shouting, hello, hello. <laughs> Suddenly the door opened. There stood a slender, casually dressed young man. He looked like a grad student. And when I told him with my interview, he led me upstairs. I clambered after him, mortified. Who did I think I was asking an archivist at Dover Castle to answer my elementary questions? We entered a big cluttered room. It wasn't grand in the least. There was a motley assortment of desks, books, papers, posters, and bookcases. Then archivists who drifted toward me and began introducing themselves. Rowena Willard Wright herself, two women named Joe and Wendy, and two men, Connor, and the one who brought me upstairs, Rowan. They just seemed pleased to meet me and interested in my key. As they clustered around, I reached into my backpack and pulled out the key with something approaching a flourish. It's lovely, exclaimed Roman. <laughs> she made no move to snatch it. Clearly, she thought it was mine, and mine alone. I thought they might confiscate it and throw me in the clink. 
for she didn't even touch it at first, but had me bring it over to a table on which was spread special archival cloth. She put on gloves, took it as carefully as if it was made of glass, and laid it at a right angle to two giant keys she brought from the storage from, from my perusal. Okay, that's they were the ceremonial keys that are given in a tradition dating back to the 13th century to each successive constable of Dover Castle. Mm -hmm. um, one is 22 inches long and one is 18 inches long. I mean, you have to have a really big pocket. <laughs> The other car archivists were clucking so joyfully. The embarrassment I felt at being caught pounding and shouting at the door morphed into delight that not only had I had the guts to take this extraordinary journey because of me, but also the luck to intersect with so many people who were also captivated by John Russell's story. All of us admired the three keys, as Rowena told me about the big ones, which were 18 and 21 inches long. She said, part of the castle's ceremony is that when the Lord Warden of the Sink Ports Federation, those are the five ports, is installed in his post, he also becomes constable of Dover Castle, and he is given the keys to the castle. Usually he carries the position for life. He's given them, and then we take them back to store them. My big key was dwarfed in comparison. Romina fell into a ruminative silence. Finally, she said, Dover Castle has been called the key to England. So these are important objects. It's the key because Dover is the perfect place to invade England, as the Romans did. The country is often needed the military protection of Dover Castle. The moment felt sacred. Considerable time went by before I roused myself, opened my notebook, and began asking questions. What did it mean that John Dixwell had been the castle's governor? What were his responsibilities? Rowena said he would have been in charge of securing the castle and in charge of the local military. He had been appointed governor in October of 1659, so did not serve very long before he had to flee the country. I asked if she had a theory about why he had chosen to take the key with him when he fled. I should explain to those who don't know that after they chopped off Charles's head, for 11 years, England wasn't a monarchy. It was something almost like a republic. And a lot of people feel that the thinking of that 11 year period was one of the precursors to our constitution. So it's really, really um, I asked if she had a theory about why he had chosen to take the key with him when he fled. You'd have thought he'd have taken away something more personal, so perhaps this is the key to his chambers. He would have had a place to stay here. Very few people did. Rowan, the young man who had opened the door for me, came over with a book that helped place my key in the right century. Then Rowena explained that it's three parts. It's three parts the ward, which is the square part that turns inside the lock, the shank, which is the stem or shaft of the key, and the bow, which is the circular part at the top. Rowan pointed out that my key's bow has a distinctive, where is it? My key. Kidney shapes. Yeah, it's like a kidney at the top. Mm -hmm. Just like the book's illustration of the 17th century key, so they knew it was 17th century. Is, am I audible? Oh. Yes. We again fell into a worshipful silence. Then Joe asked if I wanted tea. Soon the six of us were seated at the far end of the long table that held the keys dipping into an ample supply of cookies and chocolate-covered biscuits, which I did bring for you for me. <laughs> we poured milk into our steaming mugs from a bottle of Connor Fetch from the half fridge. Once again, I had that sense that Rowena, that, that all of them took their time to study and try to understand and fully appreciate whatever came their way. It was so wonderful being with them, I lost all track of time. They were funny and smart, and now that I was relaxing over tea, I noticed their room was a place where they enjoyed themselves tremendously. On a nearby shelf were a Barbie doll on a little sofa, a beaming nun puppet, brandishing boxing gloves, and a teddy bear. A diminutive jar of Nutella sat beside someone's computer 
and a gold-toned life-size ceramic bunny lay on another desk. I ate a lot of cookies and so did everyone else. Rowena dabbed briefly at crumbs that had landed on her chest, but it was clear they didn't bother her a bit. There they remained, clinging to her sweater. We talked and talked while people pulled various books on teas out of the bookcases and gradually came to conclusions, to conclusions about wine and what vanished door it had probably unlocked. Best of all, Rowena thought it was the real thing. I'm pretty sure it is a Dover Castle key because it's not made out of brass, which you might expect from a fine gentleman's block for his home, but rather it's made out of a more rich, heavy iron alloy, she said. It's cheaper metal and plainer as well. They all felt it would have unlocked the governor's lodging in the constable's tower, which is at the entrance of Dover Castle. It's the most important and impressive lodging in the castle. The head of the army to the south of England, the brigadier, lives there now, so we can't go in. <laughs> but she said we could stroll over and look at the outside of it after we finished eating. Everyone had nice things to say about John Dixwell, and Wendy must have noticed my sensitivity about my seventh grade grandfather's role, for she said, I don't think any of us has a problem with your relative being a regicide because it was a long and slow process to becoming a constitutional monarchy. Is that affirming or what? <laughs> <laughs> Next, I asked how they thought he got out of England. It's not too long a leap to imagine him commissioning an escape. It's dead easy from here, only 21 miles from France. Fishing boats were going back and forth all the time, said Connor. Then I repeated the question I particularly cared about. Why do you suppose John Dixon chose a key to take with him when he fled? Gently, Rowena picked up his key again. Why did he bring it with him? It's the key to England, she decided. It's a memory of who he once was. I'm sorry. It's a memory of who he once was and what he once was. As an answer, that felt right to me. In fact, it felt deeply satisfying, as if Rowena were honoring not only John Dixwell and his key, but also me and my decision to come to England, bearing the key, trying to understand my radical ancestry. I looked at my watch and was amazed to see that three hours had gone by. Everyone else seemed surprised as well, but Rowena wanted to do one more thing. She had to show me the place she was almost certain the key had unlocked, though the original keyhole was no more. We headed out to the apartment where John Dixwell had lived. She pointed out the Roman lighthouse, dating from around 50 AD. No kidding. Then we arrived at the constable's gate, which construction had begun in 1220. Above it rose the governor's lodging. We went through massive wooden doors, then under the apartment to a bridge over a dry moat. Before us was the English Channel stretching to France. High behind us was a wooden balcony which Rowena said was the date 1644 carved on it. Dixwell must have stood there, gazing off to sea, keeping watch. We stood in silence and gazed as well. Chatting all the way, we walked back to the stone hut. I picked up my key, and as I wrapped it in this plastic bag, one of the archivists gently suggested I store it in a seal-type container with a pack of silica gel and keep it dry. <laughs> <laughs> Another had the idea of sending a photo of it to the metalwork department at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. First, don't give them any background information and see what they say about it. <laughs> at last, with considerable reluctance, I said goodbye. Be proud of him, Rowena called after me as I headed down the stairs. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, there's not too much more to go. Hang in. Okay. So I just want to say um, the other regicides ever really in William Goff. Dixwell first fled to Germany, where he lived for several years until it became clear he could never be safe on that side of the Atlantic. Two other regicides, Europe regicides, Edward Whaley and William Goff, had left England for the New World in 1660 just as Charles II was being restored to the throne. Soon, the surviving regicides who remained in England 
were in the new king's crosshairs. Several were brought to trial and drawn and quartered. Whaley and Goff got out just in time. And by the way, they dug up Cromwell and they hung him, they hung his corpse, and then they chopped off his head and they put his head on a pike for 25 years. And then it disappeared and it was in some private museum until the 1960s. But I think it's now been reunited with the rest of them. <laughs> in New England, they found a sympathetic reception. Some of the most important people in the colonies entertained them and later helped conceal them. Eventually, they wound up just down the street from where we are now. How I'd love to have the opportunity to do my book launch in Hadley because the entire town was so brave more than 350 years ago, and the town is still paying tribute to the regicides today. In my family, even though I was given Dix Wallace a middle name, and I'm directly descended from John Dix Rome, it wasn't Tony's. Nor was it Tony by the heavy Charles I in London on a cold January day in 1649. Why didn't my father talk about him? Just a few months ago, I found out from his second cousin who grew up near New Haven, that her father talked about Dick's Wall all the time. <laughs> what a contrast. <laughs> he took his seven little kids, there are seven, to um, Dick's Wall's grave and all this other stuff. So, and in my book, I talk about, I hope somebody somewhere has the sword that's mentioned in his will. They have the sword. <laughs> and she sent me a picture, which I'll show you shortly. So, for many, many years, the town of Hadley has honored its connection to Wayne Goff. Thanks in large part to Hadley, both managed to escape to avoid being captured and tortured for their role in the regicide. Hadley was their safe place for many years and could have been severely punished for hiding them. Digsville came here in 1665, but we don't know how long he stayed. We do know he wound up in New Haven, where he changed his name to James Davis and lived relatively openly, even marrying at an advanced age and having children with a much younger woman, a native of New Haven named Bathsheba. <laughs> <laughs> Hadley has a sign way outside Chili's restaurant on Loop 9. Here it is. Right near Stop and Shop. Have you ever noticed? <laughs> I thought you'd say that. Can you read it? Yeah, I read it. Hadley, Indian land called Norwatic, settled in, in 1660 by families from Hartford. The regicides, Generals Goff and Whaley, were concealed for 15 years in the pastor's house. Mm -hmm. The pastor's name was John Russell, and that's why Route 9 is called Russell Street. Mm -hmm. and that's why you need to appreciate this, <laughs> which is just down the street from the Dunkin' Donuts. Did you ever notice? <laughs> And not to forget. And if you visit the totally beautiful cemetery, I should say graveyard because they might be redundant on an English t shirt. If you visit the beautiful graveyard on Cemetery Road, you will find John Russell's tabletop grave, which was placed there in 1692. And here's what it says on the grave. This wonderful man who was heard, took care of the graveyard for years. I'm sure some of you should know his name. He had this brass plaque name. The Reverend Russell, the Re Reverend Russell's remains, who first gathered and for 33 years faithfully governed the flock of Christ in Hadley till the chief shepherd suddenly but mercifully called him off to receive his reward in the 66th year of his age, December 10th, 1692. It's so beautiful, you've got it wrong, okay? But no one knows for sure where Wigley and Goss remain so, because, you know, I mean, John Dixwell, I mean, you didn't, if you were a regicide, and don't forget, for 100 years after they came here, it was still, we were still part of England. So British soldiers would go and probably pee on the graves, you know, or worse. <laughs> so this, let me see. 
John Dix was remains were buried in New Haven, but my center church on the green. This first marker was small. Oh, wait, I, I want to show contrast. That's probably, that's 17, 1745. That's a Hadley house. And I like to imagine that um, John Knox's house looked like that. And that, that the registers were hid behind the chimney. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> that is a sheet that is like the sheet John Dixon had when he owned 5,000 acres. <laughs> That's a county Kent sheet. That's a Haddle Kent. <laughs> That's John Dixon's fields. That's Haddle. So you can see John Dixon probably loved it. So yeah. those are the streets right near Yale University where I'm making exercise. Can you still hear me? I hear this. I hear this. That's John Dixon's first grade marker. And it just said J.D. because they, he changed his name to James David, so he didn't get to the And um, so it just said J.D., but even so, British orders did P.I. just prior to the Revolutionary War. And Ezra Stiles, who was the best we yelled at all about that. It was kind of fun. So it turns out, though, let's see, in the 19th century, Dixwell descendants who made a lot of money in the opium trade in China. <laughs> they, had, they paid for a much faster mindset. Yeah. There it is. Imagine. Describing his, de his deeds in some detail, because it's four slides and they say a lot. Uh, but it turns out that Whaley Graf are right nearby. This is behind, it's interesting. He's behind the church, which does seem a little like nodding to his being a bad guy. Um, if you look at this, you see that little gray thing there between the close together columns? Yeah, and that one? Those are plaques. Those are plaques, one from Whaley and one from God. Is that the coolest? So all you have are people. I expect you to go down 91. So it turns out, let's see, it seems I'll never get out of the habit of researching this story for I felt compelled to email the church this week and find out what they knew about Wailing Goff's plaques, which I'll show you. You probably can't read it. I wrote down everything that it says. I'll read it if you want. Yeah, sorry. Is, really? Yeah. Okay, but first, well, I'll check it. <laughs> it says a lot. Okay. In memory of the regicide, Colonel Edward Whaley. That's not true. He was a major general. <laughs> Dixel was a colonel. He was much more important than Dixel. Son of Richard Whaley, Esquire, member of parliament in the last days of Queen Elizabeth, and first cousin of Oliver Cromwell. A stalwart Puritan, he rose to high command in the Civil Wars. He was the fourth signer of the death warrant of Charles I, was one of the major generals governing England under Cromwell. Everybody hated them. And after serving in two parliaments, was elevated to Cromwell's other house. The other house was the House of Lords that they abolished. And they called it the other house to pretend that they were just folks. It's that a lot of people, you know, they were so disgusted that all the judges quit and stuff because these were commoners and you know how they are. Right? In 1660, at the restoration of the monarchy, he fled to America with his son in law, William Goff, excluded from the act of indemnity, meaning might, they might have been pardoned. They came to New Haven and were hidden in the homes of Reverend John Davenport and William Jones, subsequently in a cave on West Rock and in Milford. Thence they went to Hadley, Massachusetts where they remained concealed in the home of the Reverend John Russell. There Whaley died, 1674-5, and there found sepulcher, but really we don't know what's there. They've never been able to establish that. All right, you want another one? You do. Yeah. All right. Colonel William Long, a member of the High Court of Justice, which in 1649 tried to condemn King Charles I of England and a sign of the King's death mark. He served with distinction in the parliamentary army, and in 1655 was appointed one of the major generals who governed England under Cromwell. 
He was in turn a member of both houses of parliament. At the restoration of the monarchy, I can't believe they took us all on one stone tower. <laughs> At the restoration of the monarchy, he fled to New England with his father-in-law, Edward, I mean Colonel Edward Whaley. After several years of concealment in New Haven Colony, the two regicides went to Hackney, Massachusetts, there remaining until the death of Whaley. Tradition relates that in 1675, during King Philip's War, Colonel Goff suddenly appeared and rallied, rallied citizens against the Indians and then vanished. He called the Angel of Heaven. From 1676 to 1679, he lived in Hartford under the name of T. Duffel, like Duffel Bag. But of his death and place of burial, nothing is known. So I'm just going to end my talk with the email that did come back from the church historian just yesterday. <laughs> Good evening, Ms. Brown. Your email was forwarded to me by Senator Church Secretary Linda Consiglio, as I've been serving as a church historian for a few years now. The regicide plaques, as they are known, were dedicated on October 6, 1935, their Works Progress Administration, WPA project. Is that the coolest thing? Created and federally funded on the City of New Haven's Federal Art Project and were signed by artists Salvatore Milky and Peter Santos Saldivar, beginning in 1934. Best of luck with your book reading. Mm -hmm. Cheers, Michelle Georgievich. Fascinating. I guess I'll never Talk next week, and I heard you mentioned you uh, and if there are any questions, uh, your presentation was absolutely wonderful. So, thank you for that. Did you mail several copies of your book to Dover Castle? Not yet, no, okay. no, no, no. because it's going to be next year, almost certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Edward. Dixie, can you say why you go by Dixie and not Sarah and how you feel <laughs> random? <laughs> well, like, Dixie's just the worst name. I mean, people would say to me, are you from the South? <laughs> so, and, and so it's because my mother's name was Sarah, and so the name was already in use. So I didn't get to use it. So why did your dad give you well, we have to ask him, but he died in July of 2000, so I can't. There's somebody in the back. So I'm wondering about the connection between the Regicide Barn and Gilbert, Connecticut. It must be one of the places where they were hidden. They were hidden, hiding there. Yeah. And I, it's been years since I've seen the sign. There's a little sign on yes. the main road nearby. And it says three of the Regicide judges. Yeah, so I was just wondering if I think that part is wrong. Like they say, there's there's paintings of the judges' cave and it has three people, but it was really only Whaley and Goff because Dixville was still in Germany. Yeah, all right. I think this is the president of the land is Dixwell. Oh, you got me on. I didn't show the key. Oh, wait, I found the key. That's 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 right. That's right. I mean, I'm sorry. That's Bathsheba's grave. It's mm -hmm. so beautiful. Yeah. Still in perfect condition. She's such a survivor. <laughs> you wouldn't want to be run through with that. And then was there one more? Oh, and then this, which is right near Escalon. I never knew about that. Is there another one? That's it. Yes, Lord. Thank you for successfully fascinating me about this topic because until now you talked to me about this, I thought it was totally obscure. I yeah. <laughs> say I'm really drawn in. Um, so my question to you is, have you been working on this? It seems to me you're doing something really unique, which is essentially apprehensively climbing into your family tree without knowing what's up there. And I'm just wondering if you encountered other people who <laughs> done that kind of investigation into their own family. You can count other people wanting to work on this who are doing something similar. 
Well, we just, I just need to be stinger of beer. I mean, I already knew that about myself. <laughs> That's really work. I hate it when people ask me how long. It's been 42 years since they learned of this existence. So you've never stumbled on somebody else that's doing this. No, but there must be. I mean, like my publisher. Where is my publisher? Mm -hmm. Steve Strymer is directly descended from some really important people from the English Civil Wars of the 1640s, which were wars that King Charles mm -hmm. waged against his own people. Mm -hmm. Two people, Richard Overton and Robert Robert Overton. Was it two? Seven Great Seven Great So we're exactly the same age. <laughs> That's the only reason he said the book. <laughs> so lepers were a big part. Well, oh, the, well, I should have mentioned the lepers. They were this wonderful group who started believing the ninety-nine percent, and let's not have the one percent own everything. Those were the lepers. They even thought women should have the vote. I think <laughs> they, they were wrong. <laughs> yes. Um, there's so much history about. Big swell spot in New Haven, really. There are streets named after now. Have you done any research there, like extensive research? Well, what was what's so wonderful is, um, you know, that label on the key. I, I have a facsimile of it. This is my, the handwriting of my um, great great grandfather, F. Sergeant Dixwell. And he had all the letters that John Dixwell had received in exile. And he made the decision to give them to the New Haven Museum. So they're just fascinating. Everybody uses them who does anything about the regicides. But but John Dixon was a was one of the less important regicides, mainly about the especially started this song by talking about why trying to find out my child was actually killed. Yeah. I never find it out. Oh well, because he kept he was he believed in the divine rights of kings, which meant that whatever he said went. And um, if Parliament wanted to share a little power with him, he just sent them home. Um, he, he reintroduced all these horrible taxes, like ship tax, and um, people. It just all the wars, the little civil wars. They not little. They drained the country of resources. People were starving. Um, I do have a character you want to hear about it? Yeah, it's, it is awful. Let's see. Ooh, maybe I don't. Yeah. Let's see. After Charles I became king in 1625, his largely Protestant subjects began to worry about his French Catholic wife, Henry and Maria. And we know that this question is Catholic. So. And the royal couple's love with fun. Puritans wrote pamphlets denouncing the lavish musical theatrical stage for the king, his queen, and nobles. They were appalled when he reissued in 1633 the Book of Sports, which authorized various forms of recreation on Sundays. Protestant lawyer William Prynne published a criticism of the queen dancing and called female actors whores. He was sentenced to life in prison and had his ears cut off. I actually think they were cut off twice, if that's possible, <laughs> on the podcast on English. Nevertheless, numerous sects of Protestants, Protestantism proliferated. The more radical of their members determined to root out what they saw as idolatry, verging on Catholicism, smashed stained glass windows, and destroyed priceless art in cathedrals and in the homes of royalists. The turbulence did not shade Charles's belief that he ruled by divine rights. As king, he was second only to God in the great chain of being, ordained by God since time immemorial, with everything from angels to earthworms to minerals in appointed places. Charles thought absolute power over his subjects was not only his right, but also his duty to subdue resistance to his increasingly tyrannical policies. He instigated not one, but two civil wars against his own people. To fund the wars, he levied various capricious taxes that drained the country's resources. The loss of life was probably higher than that of the First World War. Unpaid troops plundered freely. Impoverished citizens were required to house soldiers from both sides of the conflict. 
wounded war veterans begged in the streets. The weather was terrible. Crops failed. So, uh, Bruce, you had a question. I was just wondering if your next project would be the work of one of you know, it's already written that um, and um, was Aria, who is my second cousin, told me about that book. I was so embarrassed and ashamed. Um, are there a few? I, how long may I go? It's fine. It's 12. Oh, can we look? He's there. And you've come all this way and lost all the business. Yeah. Oh, that's the is that Martha? So, any other questions? Yes. Did you um, gradually come to the conclusion that maybe your ancestor was on the right side, or was there one moment when you suddenly realized, oh my gosh? It, it was. It was really gradual. Um, yeah, I think because my father was so weird about it, I, I, just I had so much. Yeah. It just I thought, well, you know, it was sort of. And, and, and what a rat to cut off somebody's head is just so. I, I guess it was sort of learning how what a mess things were during his rule. I mean, it really was, was pretty terrible. Yeah. And yeah. you must really wonder, I mean, you must really regret that you didn't get a chance to talk to him. You do that. My, well, why didn't I ask him? That's a good question. But I do, but now I want to tell you in trying to promote this book, I reluctantly and miserably got myself a Twitter account. <laughs> and so this woman in New Zealand, when I posted a picture of this, it got 2,000 impressions right away. But this woman in New Zealand wrote, wrote to everybody, such a beautiful face, such a beautiful man. Why put him on the cover of a book about one of his murderers? <laughs> 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 but but I put up this on, on, on Twitter and you, you want to guess how many impressions it got in five days? Ten thousand. Why? Well people said in England they loved markers of all kinds. So markers those old blue markers all over and then just shiny ones that say Virginia Wolf had the idea for to like us right here. It was out of stock. <laughs> Another question? <I'm> a lot. <laughs> uh, uh, my question is how to One, the first one is how did you celebrate Queen's Jubilee with all this? <laughs> and, uh, hey, I didn't. I, I didn't notice it. Isn't that terrible? Because I was so busy getting ready for this terrifying <laughs> report. <laughs> In writing this book, how much did you have? Almost everything. <laughs> The reason I have left out almost everything is Will Riley's fault. Because <laughs> during the pandemic, he, he was helping me with rewriting it. And he kept saying, Well, this is, is um, and I just wait for this part of the work. He said, Well, this is irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> Dixie, I just have a quick language question. I don't know if you were in the homicide, which would be the act of the killing. In yes. regicide, I would have thought, and so this point would have been the act of the killing, yes. but it seems like you're using it as a descriptor of the person doing it. It has two meanings it's the person who does the killing yeah. and the killing itself. It's sort of odd. Yeah. Yeah. But you're right. They could have said a king slayer. <laughs> Well, again, I want to thank Dixie, and also I'm hopeful for showing up for this interesting talk. And uh, I think we'll be hanging around for a little bit. It might be going until three. <laughs> and, uh, thanks, thanks again. Thank you, Dixie. <laughs>